everyone. Thanks for joining us today. The topic for our webinar this morning is domestic lithium, what the US government is doing to increase supply. This webinar is being presented by the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as STAP. STAP is a collaboration between the US Department of Energy Office of Electricity, Sandia National Laboratories, and the Clean Energy States Alliance, also known as CESA. Before I pass it over to our very exciting panel of speakers today, I'd like to go over a few very quick webinar logistics. All of our uh, attendees are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of the webinar, telephone or mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize your webinar console to view the presentation full screen, click on the orange arrow that you see circled here. You can also click on that orange arrow to expand your webinar console. One thing you might like to do with your webinar console is to enter your questions and your comments. We have a full hour and a half for this webinar, but we've got a lot of presentations. I expect you'll have questions and comments. We'll save some time at the end for a Q&A with the audience. Type those questions in um, when you think of them. We'll get to as many as we can. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and we'll send you a link to the webinar recording and a PDF of all of the slides. Um, either today or tomorrow, and we'll post those on CESA's website as well. So with that, I will now pass it over to my colleague, Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd is a senior project director here at the Clean Energy States Alliance, and he is our moderator for today's webinar. Thanks, Samantha. Welcome to the webinar. This is another in the long-running STEP webinar series on energy storage. I'll do a very brief intro of CISA and STAP, and then I will introduce our speakers. Um, if you are not familiar, uh, Clean Energy States Alliance is celebrating 20 years um, as an organization uh, that is working with state energy agencies to help them run their clean energy programs. And we work with uh, states across the country um, we're a nonprofit, we're located in Vermont, and we are essentially a membership organization for these state energy agencies, and we do all kinds of work to help them do their work. And if you could just advance the slide, please, Samantha. Um, so here's some of the uh, CESA members represented by their logos. Next slide, please. And one of the things that we do, uh, in addition to just sort of uh, general support is that we have specific projects in particular technology areas and so this webinar is as i said one of our series in the STAP program which is the energy storage technology advancement partnership STAP is conducted under contract with sandia national laboratories with funding from us doe office of electricity we're fortunate enough to have dr Emery to uh, join us today to say a uh, uh, few words of introduction in this webinar. Uh, Dr. Juk runs the um, energy storage research effort at US DOE Office of Electricity and funds all this work through Sandia. Um, so STAP essentially is uh, a way for us to work with Sandia, DOE, and the states to put together and facilitate partnerships um, to support energy storage demonstration projects. And so we bring states to the table, we bring um, private partners, utilities, uh, folks from industry and states to the table with Sandia and DOE to put together these jointly supported demonstration projects. And I'll, um, I think I have a map in a moment where we can see where a few of those exist. Uh, there it is. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so we're, we're sort of working all over the map and I actually need, probably should update this. I do update it periodically. It gets a little stale because there's a constant churn of projects coming in and projects being developed and then sort of maturing out um, of this STAP effort. Uh, the, aside from these projects, we also do a lot of information sharing through webinars such as this one. They are all archived. Uh, we have over a decade now worth of webinars archived on our website, which you are uh, welcome to peruse and search and go and look at uh, topics of interest. Um, we also 
uh, do other things like conference presentations and uh, case studies and so forth. Uh, and uh, as of uh, fairly recently, we've begun doing more and more policy work to support state energy storage policy development efforts. Next slide, please. So again, thank you to Dr. Zhuk of DOE, who's here with us today, and to Waylon Clark, who runs the Energy Storage Program Demonstration Team at Sandia, who is not uh, with us today for supporting this work. Next slide, please. So uh, today's speakers, as I said, we're starting with Dr. Zhuk from DOE Office of Electricity. Uh, we will then hear from Dr. Pranz Pranthaman, a corporate fellow in the Chemical Sciences Division at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, who researches lithium separation from geothermal brine. We will then hear from Dr. Ihor Lova, a scientist at Ames National Laboratory, where he leads a project on the extraction of lithium from hard rock mineral minerals. Um, then we'll hear from Alexandra Christoshev, who is an engineer for the U.S. Department of Energy's Geothermal Technologies Office where she manages and oversees the critical materials portfolio, portfolio within the Geothermal Technologies Office. And of course, I'm Todd Linsky paul your moderator. And once we have heard from our speakers today, we will be addressing as many of your questions as we can. So as Samantha said, please type those in as they occur to you, and I will be looking at those during the presentations. Um, so I think, uh, that's it. And um, let me just say that before I turn this over to Dr. Zhuk, that um, to sort of set the table for this a little bit, I think everyone's probably aware by now that lithium is the dominant, um, lithium ion batteries are the dominant batteries at the moment in the market. Um, demand is growing quickly. Um, and so it's of great interest to look at where lithium can be sourced so that we can continue to meet demand. And it's also of interest because uh, some of the overseas supplies of lithium aren't under the best uh, conditions in terms of labor. And so it would be nice to secure more domestic sources for that reason as well. So um, that hopefully kind of sets the table for the discussion and the presentations, and I will now turn it over to Dr. Zhuk. You seem to be muted, Emery. How about now? Now I can hear you. Very good. Great. So I will share my screen. Oops. Yeah, there we are. Uh, can you see it? Yes, perfect. Great. And I will go to full screen. I really don't want my picture in the thing there, so I'm going to take this off. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about energy storage, and I will discuss some of the issues with lithium, the dominant technology, and what we would do without. And I'm Imre Duke, and uh, I'm uh, Chief Scientist uh, in Energy Storage Research. The good news is that energy storage has finally reached national scale. Uh, this is the picture of North American battery initiatives. Basically, all of our uh, giga efforts. Suddenly, there are a lot of them. And we have the same picture in Europe and also in Australia, China, Korea, and where have you. Uh, here is the European Gigafactories uh, map. And again, there are quite a few. In fact, there are more than in North America. 
So that's very good because uh, we have a lot of batteries coming out of these uh, gigafactories. Uh, but on the other hand, it raises the question, uh, where are all these factories getting their lithium? And is there enough to go around? Well, cumulative deployment of storage is continually increasing around the world. Uh, this is the well-known uh, uh, picture of uh, what we expect uh, lithium to be doing up till uh, 2040. And it lists all the various uh, countries that are primarily uh, using, consuming lithium. Uh, you can see that uh, the U.S. is uh, uh, here in uh, blue. China is probably the biggest one and followed by all the others. And it's vaguely exponential. Well, if we take that curve that we just saw in the last picture, which is basically the lithium demand and we look at what the supply forecast is, we notice there is a gap. And this is the supply forecast with not only the operational supply that we have now, but also with the highly probable additional uh, amount and the probable additional amount and the possible additional amount and even what we could expect from a secondary supply uh, by recycling lithium. So I call your attention to 2040, which is not all that long from here, and also to 2028. Uh, this is where we start having a gap. This is where we have a very substantial gap. So lithium supply and production will essentially become constant and they will fall short of demand. By 2040, the demand will be twice the available supply. Now, lithium, as we have mentioned, dominates both stationary and vehicle applications. So, with increasing penetration and with limited resources, there will be competition and, unfortunately, increasing prices. Now, if we break this down and we look at the two main applications of this lithium technology, uh, we find that the vehicle batteries must have high energy density. While on the other hand, stationary applications must have low price. Now, since vehicle batteries must have high energy density, uh, well, the lithium supply cannot cover vehicular and stationary supply. And in a resource competition, vehicle applications will win because they can afford a higher price, whereas stationary applications do not need to uh, go with the highest price. So, Unless domestic lithium sources in huge amounts suddenly become available, stationary applications will have to turn to new, cheaper types of batteries. And they have to rely on more earth abundant materials. For example, zinc bromium flow batteries, uh, redox flow batteries uh, using materials such as vanadium, zinc, or iron. Uh, we can also go with organic electrolytes, uh, an interesting option 
because we don't depend so much on what's out there, but we can make it ourselves. And then there is solid state and another favorite, sodium ion and advanced lead acid batteries. So we have quite a few technologies which are indeed available to us uh, to fill this gap that lithium doesn't have. Uh, companies are already beginning to try and uh, cover this area. Uh, as an example, Infinity uh, is, having, is doing a five megawatt hour, uh, which has been commissioned already, and they're planning to get active in Australia. Uh, and uh, in Australia itself, uh, in Queens, Queensland, uh, there is a big uh, plant coming up, 150 megawatts, eight to 10 hours, and this is an, uses an iron flow battery. So these are just examples, but the other technologies uh, are also finding uh, uh, companies that will, uh, do, uh, will, will work with them. So these kind of batteries are also going to be appropriate for medium duration use, uh, four hours to 12 hours. And that's in fact a uh, realm where lithium batteries uh, are not going to be playing. So we will need these earth abundant batteries uh, uh, to cover this time slot, uh, even if lithium is available. So meanwhile, lithium batteries will find applications for transportation, cars, trucks, trains, and planes. Lots of work being done on at least uh, the short distance planes. And boats, of course. But I may be wrong. And the future may be in sodium ion for both stationary and vehicle applications. Who knows? Uh, and here is the beginning, uh, the first uh, EV powered by sodium ion technology. And that is all I want to say. Uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, we should now go to Dr. Baranz Bharatman from uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratory for his presentation. Thank you. Are you going to show my screen, Sam? Okay, sorry, it's up on my screen now. Okay. So just let me know when I should advance. Okay, okay. so, okay, so I'm good. Are we in the full screen? Yes, okay. Yes, so. are you able to see okay. my screen? Yes, I can see it, okay. yes, Super. so thank you. So good afternoon, everyone, and I am excited to talk about direct lithium extraction from geothermal brines and clay minerals. And I'd like to thank my colleagues at the Oak Ridge, and also we have Alex Navraski at Arizona State University, and uh, Megan Fijimoto from Idaho National Lab, and also my partners at uh, Purdue University and Rio Tinto. So this funding was uh, provided by Critical Materials Institute, Energy Innovation Hub, funded by U.S. Department of Energy, Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, Advanced Manufacturing Office. And also part of the sorbent research was supported by ERE Geothermal Office uh, TCF program. Thank you. Next slide, please. So what are critical materials and critical minerals? And if you look at the short term as well as the medium term released by Department of Energy on July 31st. So you can see like lithium being critical in the medium term, like 2025 to 2035, just like Dr. Emery Zook pointed out. And we do have nickel, cobalt, and graphite with respect to batteries. And, and we'll be looking at, so today I'm going to focus on lithium. 
next slide please so we saw already the forecast right now from dr zo and uh, you can see the prediction was in the past uh, lithium was mostly used by 35% of applications but the vehicle domination as we heard early like 80% of the lithium source is going towards batteries for automobile applications so the demand is going to go high and we saw early this year like lithium carbonate prices went from like 53000 a ton and plunging to 11000 so things are going to go increase and decrease all those things so it's very difficult to predict and what we need is we need a the lithium carbonate next slide please lithium carbonate and lithium hydroxide so you can see like the rascal price estimate you can see like depending on the source of either mineral or the brands the cost can vary some of these things so it can vary from 5 to 10000 so the challenge is how safe we can do how cheaply low cost we can recover this lithium from these sources next slide please so you can see like when the critical materials institute was started in 2013 you can see the where the brain versus rock so we need both sources as we move along as we go all the way 2025 and beyond and 2040 and we need we cannot just rely on only minerals and we need definitely brains as well the so next slide please so what we see here on the the chart is even though we have lithium resources currently like including north america like canada and us we have only 2 to 3% domestic supply mostly it's coming from chile 36% that's a brand source argentina and uh, and australia is the 40% of mineral and you can see all these companies are trying to do and again in the domestic supply a lot of companies are getting ready to work on various sources so we'll see in the next one next slide please so direct lithium extraction we are targeting if you talk about brands so the conventional and unconventional brands so the conventional brands you can see on the first one like continental brands these are salts and salt pans in enclosed basins these are lithium rich and rich basins so here the concentrations are high and it can vary from 0.04% to 0.15% of lithium that's a quite high you can see and the stage of development is continental brands are commercial today and predominantly in south america salars in argentina and chile are in operation and bolivia is under development so you can see but the thing what happens is this is a solar evaporation and the method can take like 12 to 18 months you will see the slide on the next one and the unconventional brands we have oil field brands where the concentrations are low 0.007% to 0.02% so these are possible we have a lot of resources smaco formation and canadian oil sands alberta so we have a lot of these resources oil field brands where we can definitely even though the concentrations are low and uh, and companies are getting ready and doe like fossil energy and is trying to again funding opportunity to tap into all these things so if you look at the geothermal brands we have really good sources in salt and sea lake and here it changes from the concentration 0.01% to 0.04% so these are somewhere in between the con- conventional as well as the oil field brands the staging again it's all mainly geothermally active all in the california and also upper rhine valley of germany and france and simple materials they had a plant like early like 2010 during that time to 2015 so things went away so there are a lot of companies trying to focus on geothermal brand to the next level next slide please so let's think about uh, what are the opportunities what kind of material systems available this direct lithium extraction it comes in many approaches one simple thing is adsorbents so adsorbents sorbents when you add it can physically capture because this is a lithium chloride stream you have a geothermal brine at which is coming at hot temperatures or even the conventional brine ambient temperature so you can selectively extract 
lithium chloride when you have a mixture of very high concentrations of sodium chloride potassium chloride and you can use water to strip solution so these are possibly small like a pre pilot scale and commercial scale it's already happening in south america and we are focusing on geothermal right and the other thing the classic material is ldh lithium aluminum double hydroxide chloride i'll show some examples in the next few slides the ion exchange resins are the other kind where these are like the lithium titanates or manganese oxide the way it's done is exchange you are exchanging lithium with the proton ions from the resin and the, then you have to use the acid to delithiate using hydrochloric acid to strip lithium so the technology again nearing commercialization for both continental and geothermal right and the other method is solvent extraction and you have to use the organic chemicals the ligands to selectively extract lithium from either chloride or even sulfate from the thing and we don't have commercial operations as of today but we know in the case of rare earth extraction solvent extraction is the technique people use so it has already been used in a large scale for rare earth separation so here at oak ridge we have developed some of the work on the lithium extraction using solvent extraction so one thing my feeling is maybe it's not for direct lithium extraction but once you separate lithium chloride maybe it's for purification and concentration maybe the solvent extraction may work and the other approach is membrane so the membrane selectivity and the pore size is all possible that's again in the early stage we worked on like uh, like forward osmosis or metal organic framework some work being done at pnnl so these are different substrates being used and again companies are testing in the early stage again i would say the membrane technology may be possibility for concentration and purification and the other fifth method is electrolysis so the electrolysis again you can selectively extract lithium from the brine using ion selective membranes and adsorbent but most likely our feeling is this electrolysis process may be useful for converting lithium chloride to lithium hydroxide so that's going to be the starting material and to recycle water so these are the approaches known and i will just uh, touch on adsorbent next slide please so this is the flow chart for the salar brines conventional brines so here the lithium recovery takes 18 to 24 months spm so you can see like different ponds they just use the solar evaporation and it's a slow process and you can but still you can achieve almost we saw like 40 to 50 percent you can get lithium from the solar bright so next slide please but what we were looking for mostly like through the critical materials institute looking for uh, lithium removal from the geothermal brine so what you need is the brines are coming at very hot they have to keep it at 125 degrees celsius to keep the brine so it keep all the salts dissolved so we have to use like pre silica management you can use a nano filtration so that you pre silica removal then we focused on lithium adsorption next slide please you can just click so you can see the in this case uh, the lithium adsorption selectively extract lithium chloride this is happening at 95 degree and you can get the lithium stream and once you have the lithium stream you can con concentrate you will get like 3% solution you can concentrate up to 40% convert to a lithium chloride to hydroxyl like i talked about electrolysis or lithium carbonate so that's what we focus on and whereas other co minerals like zinc manganese and other potassium can be recovered so that you can improve the economics of lithium extraction the next slide please yeah so we worked on membrane and all so this is the lithium aluminum double hydroxide structure so the basic formula is one mole of lithium chloride to two moles of aluminum hydroxide aloh price and you have n so this has a hexagonal symmetry and the lithium is located in the wake and octahedral sites of aluminum hydroxide so you have a double hydroxide layer and lithium is occupied in the layer and you have like separated by water and chloride ion 
so that's the thing we published a lot of work on this uh, structure next slide please so when you use this lithium aluminum next one so this is the crystal structure where uh, the lithium chloride is initially intercalated into a gibbsite aluminum hydroxide and you have the LDA structure so then you can like remove part of the lithium chloride from the system activate the sorbents then you treat with you, this is uh, based on a chloride principle where it just only lithium chloride can be absorbed and it will decompose to or maybe LDH with low lithium chloride then so it's done like a three-step process one is first do the lithiation then you can do washing to remove any other absorbed intermediate species like sodium and potassium or then you do the stripping delithiate using a dilute lithium chloride solution so these are simple just like battery you are intercalating lithium chloride in and out of the LDA structure next slide please so we have done like a column extraction so this is a schematics of a column extraction where you have a geothermal brine and wash and strip method and here we are plotting lithium concentrations from the different bed volume load wash versus strip so you can see like uh, the lithium is absorbed and from the concentration it's about 300 to 400 ppm of uh, lithium here and we can get mostly the lithium out and in a bed volume so the other thing is this operates at 95 and the lithium chloride is separated instantly. So you can do a continuous process like a column extraction. So with, within a few hours, you can do it compared to the ones we saw in the case of evaporation in cellar brines like 18 months. So that's where this opportunity comes in. Next slide, please. And I have plotted uh, all these concentrations of uh, different ions like boron, so calcium and magnesium and manganese, all these things so all are removed mostly what you will get next slide please so the table gives like a selectivity and this is really effective in uh, removing you can get like 90 to 95 percent of uh, lithium chloride out and you may have a little bit of sodium and potassium so that's where the purification process may be needed and some of the methods we talked about either a membrane solvent extraction can be used for purification then the electrolysis to convert to lithium hydroxide next slide please so one thing what we did was we need to do like a mainly like want to see how much is the loading process and all those things we did on small lab scale so we worked on lithium aluminum double hydroxide ldh and iron doped ldh so we modified and all those things. So these are simple trials. You can take like uh, water and 95 degree. You can do loading, unloading with different sorbents and all those things. You can actually run this ICP and do batch process. Instead of column, you can select all these things. And the next slide, please. Under. So what we did was we developed some isotherms for lithium absorption using LDH. Here we have a different concentrations of lithium and the LDH and iron LDH. It's like six milligrams per gram. And the stability we checked and also 125. Very recently we have found instead of LDH, we could also use some aluminum hydroxide. Those have very high record of like 30 to 40 milligrams per gram or even higher depending on. So some exciting things are coming along using uh, second generation sorbents. So some of the work is being supported from the geothermal into this. And here we have the forward osmosis technique we demonstrated in the past using Ramesh Bhave. So we have a paper published and the patent where we can concentrate 3% solution up to 25% of lithium chloride solution. So it's very easy. And the next slide, please. We have done like, a both uh, life cycle analysis and also techno-economic analysis. So we combine the use of LDH with the forward osmosis, then finally lithium carbonate production or lithium hydroxide. So it shows like lithium carbonate can, can be produced as a carbon footprint of 34% lower than the salt flat, 26% lower production from the spodumene. So it's going to be a really economical process and also it can achieve 48% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So we publish again. So the next slide, please. So 
So here uh, we have a projection of uh, economics combining the sorbents and the forward osmosis membrane we develop. Within a year, if somebody starts a company, they can see a profit using these processes. And we, what we want to do is, as a national lab, we want to license the technology to different companies. So one such company, next slide please. So we are working with uh, Lithos Element 3 company and we are trying to scale up. To summarize my talks, mainly we showed iron LDH and iron doped uh, LDH sorbents are promising. It has a high selectivity and high capacity and we have developed some membrane and solvent extraction for further purification and uh, sorption and solvent extraction are directly came from sulfate stream. So we have also done from clay minerals where we can use a sulfate stream and remove. So the challenge is so far we have done mostly with the simulated brine. So that's where uh, some of the DOE is looking at. Can we do at the site? So the geothermal site, real demonstration. So that's something will be coming up in the next year or two. So thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we will now go to Dr. Hor Lova from Ames National Laboratory, who will be speaking about extraction of lithium from hard rock minerals. Thank you, Todd. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. It's in presentation mode, right? Yes, perfect. Great. Thank you. So, my name is Ihor Holova. I'm a staff scientist in Ames Lab, and I'm also a PI of uh, the project where we try to extract lithium from hard rock mineral spodumene uh, with our industrial partner, Piemont Lithium, and we work with uh, critical materials on that. So today I will discuss why U.S. should diversify lithium supply uh, to include hard rock minerals and how we can achieve it. So first, I want you to consider uh, the following question. So now you can see me, great. So the first I want to, you to consider the following question. Is lithium demand underestimated? I think yes, it is underestimated, but let's check the facts. So uh, to answer this question, we need to understand where the demand is coming from. Here I have some data from Bloomberg 2020. So it looks like historically uh, consumer electronics is contributing to the demand, but actually the transportation sector is driving it. And it is predicted to grow even further, dominating the market. And that is understandable why. With the materials uh, you need for a single EV battery, one can make actually around 5,000 uh, smartphone batteries. Another thing is that over the past two decades, decades uh, the consumer electronic market has been saturated while EV market just emerged and uh, is growing. So since it looks like EVs, are driving the demand, uh, we can actually use EV sales uh, to answer this question. And here I have data uh, for EV sales, also from Bloomberg in 20, for 2019. So I have updated those with uh, the recent data from, from Bloomberg 2023. So as you can see in 2020, uh, it looks like uh, their prediction uh, did hold, but 2020 was also the COVID pandemic year, so that could affect it. However, in the following years, uh, 2021, 2022, their prediction was significantly underestimating the real uh, sales. And just for you to understand how big the market was in 2022, almost 20% of the total vehicle sales worldwide were EVs. That's quite a big number if you compare it to half a percent that was a couple of years back. Anyhow, uh, with, uh, since these predictions significantly underestimated the real data and they got the real data, Bloomberg came up with new predictions. But the question is, will these new predictions hold? To my mind, it looks like demand is significantly exceeding our expectations. It's almost doubling each year. 
So we must ensure that we can meet it. And that can be done if we increase our lithium production. So now lithium is mainly produced from two sources, hard rock minerals that are mostly spodumines and brines. And resource wise, uh, hard rock minerals constitute around 39% uh, and brines are 61% from the reserves. Uh, but more lithium is produced from hard rock minerals than brines and that is uh, mostly because Australia has quite uh, large reserves and great production capabilities. Now, when it comes to US, uh, the main source of lithium comes from brines, both for domestic production and also uh, on import from Argentina and Chile. US also has 20 sites in lithium-rich hard rock minerals with the King's Mountain Pass uh, in Carolina's Podimintin belt being the largest deposit with an estimate of around 5 million metric tons of lithium, which is comparable to what Australia has. However, despite this fact and the fact that there is much less lithium in brines compared to what it is, in the, for example, in spodumene for hard rock minerals, despite these facts, uh, still brines are the preferable a source of lithium extraction and mainly because they use the solar evaporation process which is cost effective and economical. Uh, when the, to extract lithium from hard rock minerals the processes that they use are energy demanding and generate a lot of chemical waste. But right now I believe the problem we are facing as I pointed out previously uh, is a significantly higher demand than what we expected and uh, it looks like brines lack the flexibility to meet it. Why? Well because they use a solar evaporation and it takes around 12 to 24 months to deliver lithium to the market. So uh, as you remember the demand as I showed is doubling each year and it takes a couple of years just to get lithium to, to, to the market. So it will be quite difficult for brines to ramp up the production and meet the demand, uh, which should not be a problem for hard rock minerals. It just take couple days, uh, takes a couple days to get lithium out of hard rock minerals instead of months or years. So to diversify lithium supply and ensure we meet the demand, it is important for US to develop a process that will produce lithium from hard rock minerals which are mainly spodumines. Now, what is spodumene? Spodumene is lithium aluminum silicate mineral. It occurs naturally as alpha spodumene polymorph. So the structure is very stable and tightly packed. Uh, and that's why it's extremely hard to extract lithium from it. Now, all in, and because of that, all industrial methods utilize so-called decrepitation step where they, uh, where, where they convert alpha spodumene, which is a stable tightly packed structure, in beta spodumene, uh, which is more open structure and is more susceptible to chemical attack. Uh, the problem is this uh, is being done at very high temperature. It is energy intensive step and constitutes of around 85% of the total energy cost of the process. Uh, then, uh, the extraction is done still at quite hard, uh, harsh conditions, even though we convert it to more susceptible uh, structure, but still they use uh, quite harsh conditions. And the, the main process that is being used in industry is so-called sulfuric acid roast, where they take beta spodumene and digest it with concentrated sulfuric uh, acid at 250C. Another approach that is adopted by industry is soda ash process, which is basically hydrothermal at high pressure and temperature with uh, sodium carbonate to get to battery grade uh, lithium compound. The approach we are developing is mechanochemical extraction of lithium at low temperatures or simply melt process. So our approach allows us to use directly alpha spodumene thus omitting this energy intensive decrepitation step and also we 
With our approach, we use much milder conditions to extract lithium and get battery grade lithium compounds. So the concept for melt uh, process that we are developing is pretty straightforward. We can add solid reactant to the spodumene that is being crushed and this way facilitate mechanochemical reaction in a solid state. If you're not familiar with mechanochemistry, so the reactants are mixed together at room temperature and uh, added to uh, with the grinding media uh, which are generally steel or uh, ceramic walls and then the, the, the vessel is being shaken or rotated. Now uh, when this happens ball uh, hit the powder and this mechanical energy is transferred to uh, precursors and that is what facilitating the chemical reaction and it becomes mechanochemical reaction. Uh, in this uh, case we are doing an ion exchange where sodium substitutes lithium and lithium goes in, into lithium carbonate for example forming a sol water soluble lithium compound. So there are a couple benefits using for using mechanochemistry. One Major, I was saying, is that we can directly start with alpha uh, spodumene, thus we omit that energy intensive decrepitation step. Another one is because we mill the material, it is being amorphized and uh, the surface area is quite big, so uh, the extraction of additional, uh, additional lithium that is staying behind can be done in much milder conditions. If you remember previously, I mentioned that this is 250C uh, concentrated uh, sulfuric acid or uh, hydrothermal process. Right now we can do it water or diluted acids at uh, uh, room temperature or slightly hot like 90 C. So this I discussed just the first step. So in more details there are other steps uh, which uh, after mechanochemical processing we use this powder, uh, dissolve it in water lithium carbonate dissolves whatever lithium is still in the structure is being extracted by diluted HCl for example for a couple hours after that uh, the the next step uh, is purification step where we simply filtrate and evaporate material and then uh, we go uh, the, the, it is followed by conversion step to get to the battery grade uh, compound in this case we are um, uh, precipitating lithium carbon. So with this process uh, on a small scale of 2 gram uh, we have demonstrated that we can extract uh, around 94 percent lithium uh, from the spodium. So this was done in a shaker type mill which is generally uh, uh, generally used in a laboratory uh, and uh, the way we estimated the yields was by uh, using uh, XRD phase analysis. Uh, now, uh, since we're working uh, with a small amounts of material, uh, that means we couldn't precipitate lithium carbonate without significant losses because uh, the, the amount of lithium was on milligram scale, which is was roughly what was solubility of lithium carbonate. But then uh, we confirmed our results uh, that, that we can precipitate it as they do in industrially when we moved to the larger uh, scale production. At a larger scale, instead of shaker type mill, we used a planetary type mill where the vial rotates. And this type of mill is closer to the models they use industrial. So in large scale of a 250 gram, uh, we have demonstrated that we can extract around 75% uh, lithium out of spodium. So this work is still in progress and uh, the um, targets for industry are more than 90% extraction uh, yield so we are optimizing our process to, to still reach those. Anyhow with this uh, partial scale up, partial scale up with this scale up and partial uh, extraction yield uh, our industrial partner Piemont Lithium uh, have performed uh, preliminary techno-economical analysis. Uh, for this we, will, we were comparing the industrial process, which is sulfuric acid roasting, uh, with our melt method. So just to remind you, so the first step in industrial process is conversion of uh, stable, a tightly packed alpha spodium into more open structure, which is more susceptible to chemical attack. 
So this is being done in gas-fired uh, kiln at 1050, 1100 C, and it costs around $10 per ton of spodium to, to, to go through this step. Then after we get better spodium that is digested uh, with this concentrated sulfuric acid at around 250 C uh, to, to do the actual extraction of uh, lithium. And that costs around $8 per ton. And then uh, we precipitate uh, lithium carbonate out of that solution. Now, uh, when uh, we calculated uh, the cost for our mechanochemical reaction at room temperature, it was approximately uh, $8 per ton and accounting our 75% uh, extraction yield, uh, we estimated that the energy cost savings were about uh, of 45%. What I wanted to point out is that this process, again, we, we are still uh, developing it and uh, there are ways to optimize it, uh, both for higher extra extraction yield and also uh, for um, uh, to be it more cost effective. So with that said, I would like to thank uh, all our collaborators within Ames Lab, uh, Piemont Lithium and Iowa State, and also I would like to thank Critical Materials Institute, which is now Critical Materials Innovation Hub for their support of our research. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And we'd like to thank you for an excellent presentation. Uh, we will now hear from our final presenter, Alexandra Priestashev, with the US DOE Geothermal Technologies Office. Thanks, Todd. Um, hi, everyone. As um, Todd had already introduced, I'm Alex Priestashev. I'm with the Department of Energy's Geothermal Technologies Office, and I'm excited to be here to discuss the potential of geothermal energy and how it, um, the cross-section with critical materials and how, as a technology office, we are trying to secure a domestic supply of critical materials through several investments in our program. Um, first, I wanted to give you a little bit of background on how we find ourselves in this mission space. Um, our partners at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab um, did a retrospective report on two separate funding opportunities from 2014 and 2016, looking at rare earth and critical material extraction from geothermal brines and produced waters. Um, our partners at National Renewable Energy Laboratory produced a geomining report that looked at potential synergies between the mining and geothermal industries. Um, and then also at, at NREL, uh, our partners looked at uh, producing a techno-economic analysis and benchmarking lithium extraction from geothermal brines. And long story short, without going into detail on each of these reports, lithium is the most feasible, abundant, and critical and economic critical material that can be extracted from uh, geothermal brines. Um, if you're interested in learning more on each of these reports and their findings, um, those are available on the OSCE website for downloads for free. Um, so with geothermal energy and uh, lithium extraction, it brings us to the Salton Sea in uh, California where we have um, it's basically the poster child for geothermal energy and critical materials. Um, a little bit about the Salton Sea for those that are unfamiliar. There are currently 11 operating geothermal plants providing 432 megawatts of uh, renewable base load power. And um, there's a 12 power plant uh, lithium extraction facility planned um, to come online in the next few years called Hell's Kitchen that will be operated by controlled thermal resources. Um, with that plant, oh, with, um, within the Salton Sea Known Geothermal Resource Area, or a KGRA, there's around 3,000 megawatts of available geothermal power uh, potential, um, and then coupled with the lithium resource um, available within uh, uh, the geothermal brines, it makes it a great um, area for uh, DOE investment. And so when we look at how we can provide um, 
investments in this area. Our goal at GTO is how we can utilize the power resource at the Salton Sea while extracting uh, lithium in an environmentally sound way. And so we've been working towards refining uh, direct lithium extraction technologies, as, as some of my colleagues just spoke about earlier, or DLE, as they're referred to, that can move the industry beyond this technology uh, commercialization valley of death. So the technologies are out there, the thoughts and the ideas are out there, but how can we as a um, tech office move those ideas and technologies beyond um, where they're at and into the market? So that brings us to the geothermal uh, lithium extraction prize I wanted to mention. Um, the importance of the prize was how to figure out how we could catalyze the industry by improving the state of art of DLE technologies that will lower the cost and use less energy, be more environmentally friendly technologies, uh, incentivize DLE technologies that can uh, directly convert um, geothermal brine to uh, lithium in the geothermal brine into a battery ready uh, lithium hydroxide without the need for intermediate steps, uh, transform current processes um, while minimizing capitalizing on additional waste streams, and then enabling the growth of the both geothermal and lithium extraction workforce. Um, the prize um, is a three-phase prize. Uh, we began in 2021. Um, where teams were solidifying their ideas and concepts for um, direct lithium extraction technologies. Um, there was a total of $600,000 split between 15 semifinalists. Um, those 15 semifinalists moved on to phase two where they were refining their designs. Um, and those five finalists um, split a total of $1.4 million and moved on to phase three where they worked on fabricating and testing their designs. Um, and those three winners um, split $2 million, and I'll go into more detail on those winners next. Um, if you'd like more information on the prize, um, there are several uh, YouTube uh, presentations for you to look at. So we have a prize YouTube playlist. If you go to YouTube and type in geothermal lithium extraction prize, it'll pull up our playlist for you to view. Uh, during the prize, uh, teams worked with industry advisors um, from several of the companies listed on the right side of, of the slide here um, to serve as mentors for teams. So the teams were able to work with folks in industry that are working on this problem right now and need solutions right now. Um, so during phase one, um, our IAP members participated in panel discussions about lithium extraction, um, and that is one of our videos on our YouTube playlist. So if you're interested in learning more from industry experts on what is needed in terms of moving the needle on DLA technologies, check out that, that video for sure. Um, and then IAP members um, and prize teams met through phases two and three to um, refine their designs. So industry was an integral part of this prize. And so here are our winning teams. We just announced these last week, uh, or a couple weeks ago now. Um, first place was the University of Illinois, um, winning $1 million. Um, then we had two runner-up teams, uh, University of Virginia, and um, our last uh, runner-up, uh, uni uh, Washington University, George Washington University, sorry. Um, and if you're interested in learning about their technologies in particular, again, they um, there's demonstration videos on our YouTube playlist for you to view. All right, so um, moving on to uh, our next um, investment at DOE, um, we are looking at how to better qu quantify the lithium resource at the Salton Sea. Um, through the years, there's been numerous studies that have estimated lithium resource potential in um, the reservoir fluids. And so I just want to make the distinction real quick. When we talk about salt and sea, we are not talking about producing lithium or critical materials from 
the Salton Sea itself. We're looking at below the surface where geothermal waters are produced in the reservoir. That's where we're looking. So we're not touching the, the surface fluids at all. We're looking subsurface. Um, and so when we, um, there's two different approaches in, in estimating lithium. First was um, deriving lithium from uh, wells flowed and the concentrations at the Salton Sea. And the second was looking at um, the, the fluid volume of Salton Sea Reservoir. Um, and then in 2009, USGS uh, did a heat flow uh, study and using sediment thickness and distribution of, of sediments to drive lithium and, and power potential. But no one has looked at before has looked at where exactly is the lithium coming from and how much is exactly there. And so our partners at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab um, wanted to develop a better constrained geologic model, understand what's actually controlling the concentration of lithium. Um, and so looking at the reservoir rock and other resources, other sources of lithium rather, and how does the lithium concentration potentially decrease over time. Um, in conjunction with a uh, reservoir characterization study, uh, Berkeley was also looking at um, freshwater usage in terms of lithium extraction, how much fresh water we, are they going to be using, chemical usage and extracting in, in terms of the state of the art right now, how much chemicals are being used and, and potentially um, being added back into um, the geothermal reservoir, air quality emissions, and any potential induced seismicity when uh, geothermal fluid is, is being reintroduced back into the, the reservoir. Um, and then the third piece of, of their study was looking at community impact of lithium extraction. And so uh, there's environmental justice component, community outreach, education, and uh, cross-governmental collaboration. So our work with, um, as well as the state of California and others, how lithium extraction and, and the development of Lithium Valley would potentially impact the community um, near the Salton Sea. Um, and so I don't have any results here. We're still, the results have been published or not been published, have been finalized and we're working towards publishing those results sometime towards the end of October. And so if you're interested in learning more about the results from this project, the best way is to subscribe to our um, geothermal website, which I will provide later on in the slides and you will be, um, informed when that, that report is available. And the last thing I wanted to mention for everybody um, is our partners at the Advanced Manufacturing Technologies Office. We partnered together on a, a funding opportunity announcement for lithium extraction and conversion from geothermal brines. Um, so we announced uh, $10.9 $10 million for 10 projects. Um, covered over topic area one where in topic area two. So topic area one covered a fill validation of lithium hydroxide, hydroxide production from geothermal brine. So we're looking at pilot or demonstration scale projects um, that are moving that tech, that um, commercialization valley of death needle and how we can get technologies out on the market. And topic area two is looking more at your applied R&D for direct lithium extraction projects. So looking at um, DLE technologies, um, technologies that increase um, efficiency, reduce waste generation, looking at the pre-processing, post-processing of, of these brines in terms of the, the extraction process. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, I put the website there on the screen or so you can follow these projects along. Um, and so thank you for um, your time today and learning more if you're interested. And as I said, if you want to be informed about when reports are published, when funding opportunity announcements become available, the easiest way is to subscribe to our newsletter at geothermal.energy.gov. We also have an amazing 
lithium story map that walks you through the history of um, our involvement as a tech office and DOE in um, lithium extraction, as well as how lithium extraction has evolved over the years um, at the Salton Sea in California. Um, if you are interested at all in serving as a merit reviewer or becoming more involved um, with our office, please send us your resume or CV to um, the, the website there, or the, the email rather, there. And if you have any other questions, my email is down on the screen. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, why don't you stay with us, Alexander? Everybody else could come back, uh, back with your cameras on. We're going to uh, address a bunch of the questions that people have sent in. Um, so if you could just come back on screen. While we're doing this, I should mention that uh, the speaker bios for our speakers today are in the handout section. So if you look at your, uh, your webinar console, there's a, there's a drop down uh, section called handouts and there's a PDF there. If you're interested in learning more about today's speakers, um, that will give you the information. Okay, um, so first question, Somebody is asking, does the lithium extraction or and or refining process result in any hazardous byproducts or gases? And I guess since we're talking about different extraction and refining processes, there might be different answers to that. Anybody so can jump in. I can, yeah, I can go first. And this is Parant. So, the one we use like sorbent for extracting selective lithium chloride, we are not adding any reagents and the pH is seven. There is no chemicals or any reactions happening. So you are selectively removing the lithium chloride and lithium chloride is in the solution. So there is no gas evolution or anything. And only when you convert, you can have like lithium chloride to lithium carbonate. Again, it's a precipitation process, soda ash, are an electrochemical process. So I don't see any evaporation gas evolution in the direct lithium extraction process, the ones I talked about. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? So I can talk about extraction from hard rock minerals. So the way they extract it, uh, uh, the way they extract lithium from spodumene, they need to convert it from alpha to beta. And this conversion uh, actually takes place in a gas-fired kiln uh, where they heat directly uh, spodumene or concentrate uh, with a gas and that produces quite a lot of CO2 in the process uh, which contributes to greenhouse gases. Additionally, when they use uh, uh, the sulfuric acid roast, uh, these uh, uh, generate quite a lot of uh, uh, chemical waste. So uh, these are the two main factors that contribute to uh, environmental impact of the currently used industrial process. Okay, great. Uh, there is a question regarding the Thacker Pass and McDermott Caldera US uh, deposits. The question is, what timeline are you factoring production for Thacker Pass and McDermott Caldera production in your models? And the person is saying that based on the divergence of supply and demand in 2028, it appears that either these aren't included or that the ramp up time frame is um, becoming short for U.S. production. But I'm not, I'm not sure about that. So could, if somebody could speak to these models if you know um, whether they're including Thacker Pass and McDermott. And it may be that nobody knows. Okay, we'll go to the next question. Um, there was a uh, discussion about 
sodium ion, I believe it was. Uh, and the question is, what are the current limitations for those batteries? Well, maybe I can uh, do that one. Uh, sodium, bio, sodium ion batteries, uh, in principle, are very nice because they are basically like lithium ion. Uh, except for the fact that they are not nearly as well understood and nearly as well developed. There are, however, uh, companies uh, such as Natron uh, that already have viable uh, batteries with, with, a, uh, with a viable business case. Uh, it's a niche, a niche, a niche case but uh, it's nonetheless viable. Uh, in uh, China, they have done both uh, cars and uh, stationary batteries, but to what degree we can consider those as viable business cases, uh, I don't know. But there's a lot of interest and there's development and uh, I'm looking forward to having sodium ion as an alternative. Not quite as effective as lithium ion, but nearly so. Uh, high energy density and uh, certainly uh, widely available material. So okay. I can also touch on a little, little, little bit on sodium ion battery because we have worked on uh, different electrode materials. So based on the projection and also from the reports, right now they believe like if the sodium ion, even though the capacity energy density is less compared to lithium ion battery, the cost could be one sixth of lithium ion battery. So current projection is $15 per kilowatt hour. So that's a big promise we can see out of sodium ion battery. Well. Thank you. That does sound promising. Um, so I'm curious, uh, you know, this question about uh, specific deposits and, and sources for lithium came up. And uh, we heard a lot about the Salton Sea, which is this, down the southern tip of California. But are there other domestic sources and, and where are they geographically? And are they in different forms that would require different processes? So if you're asking about hard rock minerals, so uh, there are those 20 sites, but these sites are quite small compared to the one that they have in Kings Mountain Pass. That one is the largest uh, domestic deposit of uh, spodumene that we have in US, and that is comparable to what they have in Australia, which now is producing half of the lithium worldwide. Now, mm, regarding the brands, I am not familiar, so that can probably Parans or somebody else address this question. So sure. yes, I can go. answer the. Uh, yeah, I can answer the brand. Up, where is King? Yeah. Is it King's Mountain Pass? So King Mountain Pass been? is in Carolina, uh, Carolina's uh, Spodumene Tin Belt. So this is all together. Yeah. They they have a couple sites there. So this is all together. Okay, thank you. Charles? Close to Charleston and Charlotte, North Carolina, that's the Kings. So the one is the oil field brines, Texas, quite a bit of oil field brines, Pennsylvania, smack over. So there are a lot of areas where the oil field, even though the lithium concentrations are low, we have plenty. So one thing you don't need to do drilling are exciting just like Alex pointed out for the salt and sea. So these are the existing oil field brine. So these are coming out, the waste that's coming out. So there are a lot of opportunities available and we will be happy to provide more details if you contact me directly. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Somebody else is asking, are there any domestic brine projects which are in place? Um, and and also what would the process and uh, subsequent results be for projects such as Thacker Pass, the mine project? So 
So I guess that's two questions. Uh, domestic brine projects currently in place, and what's the process for Thacker Pass? Anybody knows? Um, let me touch on uh, right now, like there is a funding opportunity call outside. It's called the 3105. This is from the ACCM office, NETL, and they are looking at uh, critical mineral separation from produced water, minerals, and other sources. So those are opportunities are right now. November 10th, I think, is the deadline, and there are a lot of people are looking at sources. So I would say it will take like another at least two years. There are phase one type of phase two projects. So if any big companies are interested and they are going to go for produce water or geothermal brine. So that's the opportunity we have. Thank you. So the second part of the question, is it also on brines or I heard mountain pass? What, what was the second part question? Uh, they, they're asking what would the process be for projects such as Thacker Pass Lithium Mine Project? Thacker Pass, okay. I don't know Thacker Pass, what is that? Okay, thank you. Okay, so I guess we're, we, we're not sure on that one. Okay, uh, we have somebody asking about um, mineral uh, recycling. Uh, especially lithium, um, and we did a webinar recently on this topic, lithium battery recycling and reuse. Um, so I would refer you to the webinar archives at the CISA website, but I will ask our speakers today, um, because the second part of this question is, have you had a chance to include recycling capacity in your studies, and if not, uh, what are the opinions in recycling initiatives, especially in the private sector? Um, right now, like uh, EERE, Vehicle Technology Office, they are funding a project on RESA. So this is the Argonne National Lab working with Oak Ridge National Lab and R National Renewable Energy Lab. So I am part of the project. So we are looking at some of the methods where we can recycle the cathodes and the black mass and uh, recover not just the lithium, cobalt, and nickel, and graphite. So that thing is going on. So if you go to the resell website on Argonne National Lab, so you can see more details about the project and what's going on about lithium recovery from recycled lithium and battery. So. And from my the, the basic point of recycling, uh, lithium ion bat batteries is that yes we can do it uh, by a number of different ways uh, but is it worth it because you always have to look at how much the process will cost and how much the raw material or the batteries will cost and that's a an equation which you have to balance Okay, great. Uh, somebody is asking about AI, and this is, of course, the hot topic right now in almost every field. Uh, could someone speak to the current research and application of AI batteries? Uh, is this an economically viable technology? I'm not sure whether they're I referring think, yeah. to artificial intelligence applied to research in the battery field or I mean there's stuff about machine learning for advanced batteries and so forth now especially if you want to do like recycling because different uh, compositions chemistries are available so they go from lithium cobalt oxide NCM lithium nickel cobalt manganese oxide lithium ion phosphate so sometimes you may have different sources of battery so that's where probably I can think of AI where we can come up and sorting out to either batteries or dismantling and uh, helping and streets sorting it out. So maybe okay. there are some Thank opportunities you. there. Thank you. And I think we've we've misunderstood. The person has 
sent in another clarification saying they wanted to ask about aluminum batteries, not AI. It looks like AL, but I guess it was supposed to uh, AI, but it's supposed to be an AL, I suppose, uh, depending on what font you're using. So aluminum batteries, let's ask the proper question. Anyone have any uh, information um, about that? Yeah. So the aluminum batteries we worked on a few years ago. So the challenge is it's a heavier uh, three electron transfer. So you can get like higher energy density and the capacity you can achieve provided you can cycle back and forth. So we worked on some of the manganese oxide. There are some reports on vanadium oxides and all those things. And we have the electrolytes like ionic liquid electrolytes where we can cycle back and forth on the anode side and the cathode was a challenge. So then Stanford and uh, they looked at aluminum like with the carbon and they looked at uh, some batteries and so things are coming along right now. I would say aluminum ion battery and the capacities are low at this time and uh, there are more opportunities and it's going to be a cheaper material. Aluminum, yes. aluminum air is also a, a field of research. Yes. Okay, very good. Um, you know, so we, this is all we're sort of looking at various types of processing and so forth for domestic sources. Um, and as we are hopefully ramping up um, the production, of course, the demand is also going to be ramping up. So I'm curious, those of you who are doing sort of predictions or looking at models, do you think that domestic sources will be able to replace imported lithium or is it just going to merely keep up with increasing demand in other words what's the what's the potential for do we just close the gap between demand and supply or can we actually start to re reduce reliance on imports so i can answer this question if we are going to develop the technology that is going to extract lithium from spodumene, which the deposits are comparable to what they have in Australia, basically we could probably very quickly increase uh, our production of lithium and satisfy all the demands and go for export. But right now, as I know, only Piemont lithium and Albemarle are the are moving into that direction with uh, their sites in mountain pass. So I would say yes, if we diversify our supply from to 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 include hard rock minerals. So the one source I would say is uh, geothermal brine. So our estimate shows like for a given 50 megawatt geothermal power plant, we could potentially separate 15,000 tons per year. So the current production is 160,000 tons of lithium carbonate equivalent. So we have over 20 to 25 geothermal stations are available in the salt and sea area. So if you duplicate the same from each power plant, so we could potentially get like maybe 200,000 tons of lithium carbonate equivalent, which is more than the current production supply. So not just the importer, we could be the exporter provided we can demonstrate on a, all these geothermal sources. So that's where I would say the immediate opportunity is right now. However, you also have to consider that with increasing decarbonization of everything, we not only have to take care of uh, transportation, uh, we have to take care of electricity and we have to take care of the uh, building sector and the agricultural sector and the uh, industrial sector. And all of those, if all of those rely on lithium ion batteries, it would be rather a tremendous demand. And I don't think we can meet that. It, we, I think we are better off having a portfolio of technologies available. Well, 
Okay. Uh, somebody is asking, what is the potential of zinc oxide batteries with percentages of expectations? I'm not sure what percentages of expectations means in this context, but could someone speak to the potential of zinc oxide batteries? You're talking about zinc as a primary battery. Uh, you, by oxidizing it, you can uh, get a fairly nice amount of electricity, but it's a primary battery. And to make it uh, uh, into a uh, rechargeable battery uh, isn't all that easy. But zinc technologies uh, are being actively researched, zinc manganese, for ex zinc manganese oxide, for example, and uh, also zinc, zinc flow batteries. Okay. Well, uh, we are just about at the end of our time. I want to thank our presenters, um, including those on screen and those who are just uh, with us in voice only. Uh, excellent presentations. If you are interested in getting the slides or reviewing